Hey, Arlene, are you on here? Your hair looks fabulous. It's just you and me, baby. I didn't let anybody else in yet. I love it. Great. Hey, I this got is, this yeah, is poo poo hair. <laughs> oh, it looks really good. It looks blonder. Not red. <laughs> no, that's a better color on you. Yeah, it's, it's it's more. It's very pretty on you. You look lovely. You're looking Fine, good. Thank you. <laughs> You're looking really good. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there. You know, it just yeah. It was off the rails this morning, but at least I have some help today. You know, the caregivers are so they show, they don't show. It's oh, difficult. I'm sorry. You know? Yeah, so it's been hard, but doing the best <clears throat> I can. Hey, I got a question for you, and I don't know if you if you've come across this at all. Sure. I've got it's a 1936 building. I've got the garages with these old springs. They don't make the springs anymore. One of them I had had converted, I guess my mom had done it, who knows how many years ago, 30 years ago, to something called a um, uh, a Holmes, Holmes Hardware Model 1100 hinge. And that doesn't, that's not made anymore. And it's for what, the garage door? Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I'll send, if you want, I can send you some pictures, but I'm trying to find a place that might like make the hinges. I called a couple of places in Kentucky and stuff and nobody will make the make the springs. They're big old springs and I'm afraid, you know, for, for safety. Call, call, there's garage door people out there that still do the garage springs in the doors. Um, I know because there's a lot in the high desert that still use springed garage doors instead of the roll up doors. Right, yeah. And I know I'm letting people into the room. Hello, everybody. We're talking already. We're talking about springed garage doors, okay? <laughs> um, but I know there's a lot of garage door opener companies in the high desert that still use the springs. Okay. So Victorville, Hesperia area, um, there's, um, God, I'm trying, I want to say he's called the garage guy, but I don't remember. <laughs> okay. All, All right. I'll Victorville. Okay. I yeah, but I'll look it up there. But I'd start calling installers because they're gonna nobody, know yeah, where your resources nobody, are. Nobody here knows anything. I've I've called a bunch of people and yeah. they're like, just try replace the them. high no, desert. I, you, yeah. the, I'll I'll try to get his info and get it back okay. to you too. I appreciate okay? it. Thanks. Can I yeah. help you? Can I help you with this a little bit? Uh, yeah, yeah teamwork, I, guys. I used to have one of those uh, at my house. And I located it at Amazon. All you got to do is yeah, scan your spring with Amazon app. They have a scanner on top. Yeah. And it will pop up all those that are similar to your spring. And then see if you have one exactly like that and buy it. Installing it is very easy, honestly. It's just a wire passing through the spring. And you have four springs, two on each side. Am I right? Or one on each side? No. This is from 1936. They don't oh, make this. the springs anymore. Oh, okay. So mine was yeah. 1970s. So, all right. Yeah. Yeah. This is 1936. Yeah. So I like the idea of trying to find it through Amazon, though. That that's, yeah. that's yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, I tried that. Yeah. Teamwork, so guys. <laughs> okay. But thank, thank you, David. <laughs> I love that we all bounce things off of each other. I mean, I think that that's really what makes our group very unique is we're able to help each other out. And there's so many people in this industry that just go and don't say anything. And that's one of the reasons why I started this is we can all help each other out. And that's what this needs to be about because we're all outnumbered here, okay? <laughs> so getting started in today's madness, um, I'm still letting people in, so bear with me. <laughs> That's why you see me keep doing this. I'm not poking you on the nose, I promise. Um, <laughs> I'm just letting people into our room so that we can all get on the same page, reading the same book. Um, <clears throat> I've seen some interesting things happen here very recently, and I'm going to go back to talking to my corporate America because I see you're in here today. Um, when you're taking over a property, I cannot encourage you enough. Okay, all of those oral agreements that the tenant and the landlord has made with each other that we know nothing about, 
the best way to combat that coming into the property as a property manager is to serve a 30-day notice of change of terms of tenancy. And what you're changing is to revert back to the written contract dated blank. What that does is in 31 days, it removes all of the oral agreements made between the landlord and the tenant that we as a property manager don't know anything about and makes us back to following the written rules of the contract. Ah, that is the easiest way for us to know exactly what the rules are. So if you are managing property for profit and you're taking over a property, that's one of the first things that we wanna do is make sure we know what the rules are, okay? If we don't know what the rules are, it makes it extremely difficult for us to do our job. So one of the things that we do in that 30 day change of terms and taking over. Hey, Patty, Danielle here. We have a single family home in San Bernardino County that is tenant occupied. Their lease ended on the 15th of this month. The owners wanted to do a rent raise and a one year lease extension. I reached out to our tenant to make her aware of the upcoming changes. She let her know that her daughter would be moving out and she can barely afford the rent she's paying now. The owner then said they would like to give a 60-day notice to vacate. I would just like to make sure she cannot claim retaliation. Why do a 60-day notice to vacate? Just raise her rent. Okay? She can't afford the rent increase and she moves out. That's on her. If you do a 60-day, you're paying relocation fees. Make sense? Tell me this makes sense to you. <laughs> Serve your rent increase, collect the rents as scheduled. If she doesn't pay the rent on time, do the eviction. Mm, gotcha. Okay. And all I'm doing is making sure that you're not signing up to pay relocation fees. You're not signing up for the inevitable. A lot of yeah. times tenants have told us, I can't afford this increase. If you raise my rent, I'm going to move out. It's what we say, you guys, come on, <laughs> okay? It's how we, as tenants, try to get you to do an increase not so high. And sometimes a tenant will say, the increase at 10% is too high. I'm gonna have to move out. I can't afford to live here. A landlord may come back and say, okay, I can do it at 6%. I can do an 8% increase. So what it does is it opens up the walls for negotiation. Okay, if you don't care, say, oh, I'm sorry, the increase stands. Patty, if uh, uh, the tenant says, I cannot afford, I have to move out, are you obligated to uh, pay any moving fee? No, they want to move out. Okay, that's fine. Ah, ha. the problem is you can't raise the rent so high they can't afford it. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. It's called a constructive eviction. Let's say that it's exempt from all the rent control. So you can do a 20% increase or a 40% increase. That's where you get into trouble causing a constructive eviction, meaning that you raise the rent so high so quickly they possibly can't afford it and that forces them to be evicted. That is called a constructive eviction and we don't wanna do that. In fact, we don't wanna raise anything over 10%. It's real tricky trying to avoid that state of emergency. Basically, if you raise rents over 10%, it requires a 90 day notice and we cannot be in a state of emergency for that 90 days. If a state of emergency is announced, you must rescind the rent increase and then wait for the state of emergency to end and then try again, okay? I think they did it this way on purpose. So for 90 days, the chance of California declaring a state of emergency is very high, whereas in 30 days, not so much. So it's how they're still trying to control us from not doing such high rent increases. I hope that makes sense. For a musty smell in the garage or a storage room, do you suggest an electric fan dehumidifier or just install a wind power turbine on the roof. Whatever is easier. I'm not too worried about a musty smell in a garage. Um, nine times out of 10, there's smoke in there. They put their stagnant laundry in there. 
have an issue where I have something microbial growth, then I'm concerned. But um, in a garage, I really don't worry about it. And I'm being honest with you, okay? <laughs> Uh, did the battery smoke alarm change? Yes. Um, lots of light bulbs out, screen door hinge broken. Is that damage? Do I charge now for, take for the security deposit? What do I use? Let me notify them first. Okay. The battery smoke alarm did change. Okay. Now it is an all-inclusive thing that you have to replace every 10 years. It has a 10-year battery in them. Okay, so the new smoke alarms don't take nine volts anymore. They're completely enclosed. So there's no battery to put in or take out. They last for 10 years. You throw them away and get a new one. Okay, that's how the new smoke detectors are. They have a 10 year battery in them. Okay, um, lots of light bulbs and screen door hinge broken. If their light bulbs are gone and missing, you can charge them to replace them when they vacate, if they were there on the move in inspection, they must be there on the move out. In Otherwise, it is something Ms. you can charge for and take from the security deposit. Yes, yeah, I heard Patty, a question. Yeah, this is when I when I did the smoke alarms um, last week to do the semi-annual walkthroughs. Um, there were lots of light bulbs out. There was a screen door hinge broken. Um, so to me, that was that's damage. But do I charge them now? for for the for the handyman and whatever or do i keep a record and then just take it out of security when they move keep a record take it out of security if it's damaged i'd ask them to fix it well i already had the handyman fix it i got it so you can either bill it back to them is it in larso no it's a single family la city okay Send them the invoice repairs that you did that they caused make sense so what form do i use this isn't a form this is a demand for payment dear tenant on your interior inspection on such and such date it was noticed that there was damage done to the screen door and quite a few light bulbs missing i've had that repaired and the light bulbs replaced Please see the attached invoice due and payable in the next 30 days. If they don't pay you in 30 days, you have an option. You can sue them in small claims for that money or take it out of their security deposit once they vacate. But you're just sending them a letter for payment. That's all. Okay. And, and same thing for the screen that the dog ripped. Same deal. Yes, it's damage. Okay. Upon recent inspection of your property, the following damages were noted and repaired. These damages are from your uh, are are caused by your negligence, and they are your expense. Okay. Please pay the attached invoice within the next thirty days to avoid any future issues. Okay, I'll write the letter and I'll send it to you to review before I send it to you. Okay, thanks. No, no problem. Sorry. You know me. I just verbal vomit what I think you need. <laughs> Rail me back in. Okay, letting people in. Here we go. Hey, Val. Hi. Do you know if there's a newer CAA rental agreement since 2022? I'm trying to reduce the addendums that must be included, smoking, parking, et cetera. Um, no, if they have a new month to month or a new one year, it will show the date. Um, at the bottom. So look at it this way. If no laws have changed since then, then they haven't created a new contract yet. Okay. That's how that works. And from 2022 going forward, I don't think there's anything that I would be screaming about. The biggest thing is AB 1482 that we're needing to disclose. Uh, 2022 has the new mold addendums that are required. So if it's 2022, I'm not freaking out about that, Val. Just saying. After July, I expect to see a new contract come about. July of this year, when the maximum security deposit goes to one month's rent, they might make a new contract for that. But other than that, I can't see them changing contracts. There's no reason because California civil process didn't change. Hope that makes sense. 
because I'm verbally just telling you why. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hmm. The challenges we face. Oh, so fun. Anybody have anything else they want to talk about? Because I want to give you guys what you need today. Make sure that I'm getting those questions answered. You can either type them in the box down there and we can read them, or I'd be more than happy to answer them if you choose to unmute yourself. But that's on you. <laughs> Heidi, I have a tenant that uh, keeps on paying over by 2 or $3 dollars every now and then, uh, should I keep it and uh, keep a record of it or should I reimburse it right away? No, keep a record of it and just keep a rolling credit on her ledger. Thank you. No problem. This is, this is, in, even in the city of LARSO, they all have the same rule. So I'm gonna put the same rule ahead I've been following decades. Once you find that the tenant has an overage or a credit on their ledger, you have two options, okay? One is to give them a check immediately upon finding the error. Number two is to credit their ledger accordingly. I always credit their ledger. Sometimes when a tenant moves out from me, they may have a rent credit coming back to them for like 54 cents for an overpayment, but I've been carrying that the entire time. The reason I carry those overages is very simple. In the event the tenant challenges me or there's an eviction done later, what that tenant is doing is gonna scream that your notice is overstated because that two or $3 credit she knows she has, hasn't been deducted from that three-day notice amount. Oh, so you always wanna make you deduct any credit ledger from the amount on a three-day notice before you serve it. That way it reflects that the credit is being given properly. Okay. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> Anybody have anything else? Hi, Patty. I have a tenant in Southgate. Hi, Gabby. I have a tenant in Southgate, LA County that has asked me to remove her carpet because she said it's old and that her son's doctor recommended to remove it because he has asthma. Hold on to that thought because I am. Let me reread this because she said it's old and that her son's doctor recommended to remove it because he has asthma. Are we required to remove it or can we charge her to And everybody needs to listen, okay? You keep freezing. I'm sorry. Am I not frozen now? It's because I'm not. moving. I'm excited. <laughs> Check this out. What they're asking you to do is a request for reasonable accommodations based on a disability. Actually, no, I lied. It is not a request for reasonable accommodations based on a disability. It is a request for reasonable modifications based on a disability. Let me tell you a story. A tenant got an emotional support animal for her child, okay? Okay, I have to allow this dog in the property because it's an emotional support animal. But now the child has allergies. But it's not because of the dog, it's because of the carpet. So we're now requesting that you remove the carpet that my child's allergic to and replace it with something else like hardwood flooring that they're not allergic to. You and I both know it's that dog that that child is allergic to and not the carpet because they've been living there for six months with no problem before they got the dog. It's a request for reasonable modifications based on a disability. Yes, you must allow it. If there's a doctor's note saying son has asthma and needs the carpet removed, but it's not at your expense, it's at the tenant's expense. Want me to say it again? <laughs> Whenever there's a doctor's note involved and the tenant needs you to do something to the property, 
because of their disability. Install grab bars, handicap ramps, uh, change the date their rent's due because of their social security checks coming in later in the month. These are all things you have to do because they're disabled, but you don't necessarily have to pay for it. Got it. Thank you for letting me know that your son has asthma and that you need the carpet removed that her doc that the doctor's suggesting it. We'd be more than happy to allow you to do that at your expense. You must use a licensed contractor and we must be listed as additional insured or interested party on their insurance policy. <sighs> Easy peasy, okay? They pay for it, not you. How should I handle a pending construction pro project? They have a property on the balcony, properties in Hawthorne. What do I say on the notice? Are you talking about the balcony inspections? Because if you're talking about the balcony inspections that need to be done before January 1st of 2025, serve them a 3 or a 24 hour notice, letting them know that you're coming in to do the retrofitting, the construction, making sure that the balcony is reinforced, whatever it is. It's a 24 hour notice to enter for necessary or agreed upon repairs. Hey, Patty, what is the percentage of security deposit that gets returned to the tenant and when? Are you speaking about LARSO? Because only, thank you that Arlene's in here, because right at the moment, I don't know the percentage for this year that you have to return on the security deposit. Arlene, I don't know if you have an RSO certificate in front of you, but it tells you on that certificate what that percentage is that you have to return annually just on the security deposit. Oh, and oh, you, mean the in, oh you mean the interest? Yes. The What's interest? the interest currently? Um, I'll ch I, um, it was... Uh, for 2023, because that you, you don't need to do it yet this year. You wait the end. It was, uh, I believe, it was uh, 0 0.04. So 0 0.04 percent for 2023, and we don't have the number yet for 2024. It, yeah, it may it may be on there, but I I don't think it's there yet. I got you, BC. So it's 0.04 percent for 2023. Let me check. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. You're fine, Arlene. Thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll, I'll check. I want to make sure it's not 4%. I got I you. I got was, you. I think, I'm pretty sure it's 0 0.04. And Stephen, as far as them moving their personal property from the balcony, go knocking and talking. Have a conversation with them. Let them know that you have to retrofit the balcony to make sure that it's safe for them and their guests. And in order to do that, for the workmen to come in, they need to clear all of their personal belongings off the balcony. And then let them know what day you plan on coming and tell them that they have to have that prepared in advance. But I wouldn't necessarily serve a notice. I would knock and talk first. It's the business professional thing to do. And then if there's um, conflict or something like that, then I would serve notice. But it's just going to be um, a written letter asking them to remove their personal belongings from the balcony for the work that's being done. Amy, thank you. She's got its 0.04% for 2023 in LA City. Yeah, well, it's not just LA City. It's all of RSO, which is now Sherman Oaks, San Pedro, Wilmington. Want me to keep going or you get what I'm trying to tell you? <laughs> Any municipality that uses LA City's Rules and regulations require security deposit interest payments back annual. So usually it's only city of LA, city of RSO, anything like that, but now it's anything that's governed by RSO. So I believe that's Wilmington, San Pedro, Sherman Oaks. And I couldn't even go into areas of the city of Torrance. <laughs> It's a long plethora of laundry list, trust me. And how we figure out what you're governed by is to go to stayhousedla.org, click on the eviction process, and then scroll down until the background changes from white to a yellow green color, and it'll say, pause for your area. 
can enter the address. Enter the address, hit enter, and it will actually tell you what laws govern that property address. It's a great tool. I use it several times a day. Several times a day. It only works for LA County. If the property is not inside LA County, this will not work at all whatsoever. You Just said so you stay know. housed LA? Dot org. And don't panic because it's a tenant based website. I am sending you to a tenant website, okay? Because it says, got an eviction notice? We can help. I am sending you to the enemy. Okay, because if the enemy knows the rules for that address, don't you want to know? I want to know what they know. <laughs> That's how you find out. Stayhousedla.org. It's stay, S-T-A-Y, housed, H-O-U-S-E-D, L-A, dot org. You click on the eviction process. Not, not get started the eviction process right next to it. And then it'll say how evictions work and scroll down from there. Once it changes background color from white to a yellow green, that's when you can enter the property address. And then it'll tell you what rules govern that property address, which is very helpful when you're dealing with San Pedro, Wilmington, Torrance, Sherman Oaks, Glendale, there's certain parts of LA County that are now governed by LA City's rules and regulations in areas that we wouldn't think had that. So I use it several times a day now when somebody calls the law firm and says, hey, we want to do an eviction. Can you tell me what the rules are? First thing I ask is what's the address? And I plug it in there because it gives us a nice plethora of what governs that particular property. It's good enough for me to use. It's got to be good enough for you to use. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. But that's what I use. It helps tremendously. And then it gives you links. I heard on the news that more rental assistance programs are coming. They are also saying they're going to crack down on more landlords. Oh, my God. Do you know why more rental assistance programs are coming? because they don't want to add to the homelessness population. Are they forcing landlords to participate in these programs? Not yet. Not yet. Keyword. And they are. They're cracking down on landlords like nobody's business. It's not even funny. <laughs> LA County is no joke. No joke. It is quickly becoming San Francisco and New York very quickly. Stay housed LA.org. It's not stay home, it's stay housed, H O U S E D. So stay housed LA.org. I have a tenant in Montebello who has not paid March's rent and said that they will move out at the end of the month. We posted a three-day notice last week. Do you think we should wait for the end of the month to start the eviction? Thanks. You want me to honestly answer that? Because here becomes my next question. They said they would move by the end of the month, but did they put it in writing? Oh, no. I want it in pen and paper. I don't want an email and I don't want a text message. I need your wet ink on a piece of paper saying that you're going to move out of that address. It's got to have the full address and the date that you're vacating. Okay? Because in the event they don't get out when they say they're going to, I want to use that notice to get them out. Nothing sounds better in a courtroom than telling a judge you want to use the tenant's own notice to vacate against them. Make sense? Get it in writing because a text message doesn't work and an email doesn't work. The only way I can evict a tenant off of their own notice to vacate 
is if it's done on pen and paper. Got it? It must have the full complete address of the property from the street numbers all the way to the zip code. Okay, if it doesn't, it's toilet paper. Okay, if it doesn't have the tenant's signature on it, also toilet paper. If it's not dated, also toilet paper. Also must have the date that the tenants anticipate to vacate by. So to answer your question, I would ask them to put in writing that they're vacating on March 31st from the property located at blank and sign and date it. In the event they didn't vacate on March 31st on April Fool's Day, I would run down to the courthouse and file based on their notice. I don't know if I do a three-day quit first or just off of their notice to vacate. I'd have to ask the attorney. I think I'd go off of their notice to vacate. What do you mean they're cracking down on landlords? Girl, they've been saying that for decades. It's just how they try to freak out landlords in LA. They think we're all running around taking the doors off the properties because the tenant owes us rent. That is not what's happening, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but that's what they say when they say they're cracking down on landlords. Is they're putting more restrictions on us. They're putting more penalties on us. Okay, everybody understands. Uh, no text messaging. Text messaging email cannot be used as recognizable court documents. Only the tenant's wet signature. Why do you think I tell you guys, stop emailing them, stop texting them, because you can't use that in court, but they will use it against you. <laughs> Trust and believe me, they will find a way to use it against you. Biden called us greedy landlords. Hmm. Hmm. Patty, um, yeah. if say that a tenant calls and says, says they're going to move out, blah, 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 blah. Would you think it's acceptable if we wrote off the letter with the full address saying on this day, I, you know, writing the letter for in the tenant's narrative and then driving down and having the tenant sign it. Can we do that? Yes. Nobody okay, says then. you All can. Right. You said it. I didn't. <laughs> There's a lot of things I try to give you guys an idea, but without like totally feeding it to you hand, you know, I don't want to spoon feed you because that's bad. <laughs> it's real bad. But at the same time, I want you to go, oh, that makes so much sense to me. Because if it's making sense to you, what we're doing here is working. <laughs> okay. I want you to understand it. I want it to make sense to you. That's the whole point. So can you write something out for a tenant, take it to them, have them review it and sign it? Absolutely. Anything to help your tenant, right? You're helping the tenant. You need it in writing. So you typed it all up, put it out there and gave it to them to sign. I went ahead and helped assist you with your move out date that you verbally told me and prepared this move out letter for you to review, sign and give back to me, okay? I know you're busy, so I thought I'd do it to help out. Works good. All right, anybody have anything else? Not really, okay. Well, we got some interesting things coming up next month. It's Fair Housing Month, so I, I see you. I got you. I know you're coming, but everybody, please take note. Next month is Fair Housing Month, and I don't want you to panic, but hear me out, okay? I believe it is the 15th or the 17th of April that Riverside County is doing their Fair Housing training. I personally have taken this course for decades. It is the best when it comes to fair housing. So I encourage you, if you need to take your fair housing course for this year, or you want to take fair housing that actually makes sense, I highly suggest and recommend going to Riverside County's fair housing seminar. It is next month. It's $125 a person. I'll be there. I'm going. I wouldn't miss it for the world because 
This is where you learn a lot about what's actually happening in the industry of fair housing and where landlords are getting raked over the coals. This is how you actually start to understand how fair housing actually helps you and doesn't hurt you, okay? So I can't recommend you taking fair housing courses in the month of April, but if you have the opportunity to take the one that Riverside puts on, it's an all day event, it's 125 bucks, they serve you lunch, <laughs> okay? Worth every dime. How much can you raise rent in LA, in Larso? <laughs> Is it 4%? 4%. 4% maximum. And you got to be careful because some municipalities only allow you a 2% increase right now. And I think that's Glendale is only allowing a 2% increase. You know, so Beverly our... Hills uh, is 3.2%. I have one apartment there. It's even worse <laughs> with all these rich people living there. Well, you want to know something funny? And let me just say this, okay? And if I said this last week to you guys, it's me trying to bring home a point, okay? Irvine, city of Irvine, Orange County. Yes, you can serve them already. You were able to serve them on February 1. Orange County, Irvine, is now looking at rent control. And everybody's like, what do they need rent control in Irvine for? They have huge apartment communities, you know, with like 2,000 doors in them. They have dog walking services, valet parking. They have cooking courses that go on in their kitchen common area. They have all kinds. They have nail salons, beauty salons in the apartment community. Okay. Hello. Why do they want rent control on their $10,000 rent? Because they don't want it to be $20,000 next year. So they're asking for rent control also, but because they have such high dollar rents, not because <laughs> of anything else. They just, it's a high dollar rent area such as Beverly Hills. They're now implementing a three and a half percent rent increase for these high dollar homes. It's ludicrous, ludicrous. The whole idea of a high dollar home is a high dollar home and you don't have all of this stuff. How can a landlord maintain a high dollar home if they can't do an increase? Oh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Forgot about that one, didn't they? How do you maintain a high dollar home when you can't do a decent rent increase? Oh, is that, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, slow down, Patty. Is that what happened in the city of Los Angeles when they implemented rent control? Has LA been a plethora of no repairs for 30 years? Is that why these buildings are so dilapidated because the landlords are having their foot held to the fire and they can't raise the rents? Oh, oh. Does it make sense yet? Is it coming together? Yes, you can already serve them. I raised the rent on an apartment unit by 75 bucks, less, much less in market. The tenant barked about wanting new carpet, which we agreed. Then the carpet cost $950. Seems that takes one year to break even on that improvement. Just wondering if I should have done something different. Um, no, not necessarily. I wouldn't have done something different, but... I would have told the tenant, since you want new carpeting and it's warranted, we're going to go ahead and do the maximum allowed increase rather than $75 because it's taking you a year to recoup that expense for doing that upgrade. But now my question becomes, when do you start actually profiting? Because it took you a whole year just to pay for the carpet, right? So when do you benefit from that rent increase? And let me teach you guys a secret right now, okay? A secret right now is this. Anytime you raise the rent, tenants tell you about everything that's wrong at the property. They go hand in hand together. Anytime you ask for more money, 
They ask for repairs. It's what happens. Don't get upset by it. Don't get offended by it. It's kind of like the tenants always tell me about all their repairs on the first of the month. You know why? Because they're remembering because they have to pay you. Oh, that makes so much sense. But to property managers, it's extremely frustrating because we're there all month, but they wait until the fifth to tell us about everything that's broken. They just go hand in hand together, okay? I believe Inglewood's rent increases at 3%, but I'd have to go look that up. San Bernardino County, you're at 9.6 under the TPA. Exempt from the TPA, I would be at 10%. No problem. But I'd have to look up Inglewood. I want to say it's 3%. I don't know off the top of my head. But you know how you can find out? You can go to stayhousedla.org <laughs> and it'll tell you what the maximum rent increase is for that address. Remember I said I use it all day long? I really do. I really do. Stayhousedla.org. I am infatuated with it. It helps me so much. All right. Anybody have anything else? If we don't, I'm going to close this off for today and I'm going to go have some lunch. I have I have a, a question. For the Riverside County, how do we sign up for that? The fair How do you course? find out for what? How do we sign up for the Riverside County Fair Housing course? Go to their Google Riverside County Fair Housing. And then you'll see that their okay. annual conference is going on. Sign up for tickets here. It's like 125 bucks. But that's what okay. I did. Excellent. I don't know. Okay. They have three different courses. They have Fair Housing 101, which is for somebody that doesn't know anything about fair housing, how it works. It's a great resource because it tells you what to watch out for. And then they have Fair Housing 102, which is the advanced fair housing. And then they have like most current events in fair housing. So they basically have three levels. Look at it like a college course. If you're new to fair housing, take 101. <laughs> if you've already been through 101, go for 102, <laughs> you know? Um, but it is, it is. So the very first time I took this class, you guys would all laugh at me, okay? Because the law firm that I work for sent me to this fair housing course. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. I sat in the front row. I always do. I got uh, take my notepad. I'm ready to take notes. You know, I took seven pages of handwritten notes during this class because the course I was taking for was, act they signed me up for it, but it was for violators. It was for people that violated fair housing laws and they were ordered to go take this class for eight hours. I ended up in that course, okay? Well, let me tell you something. The people that taught it were tenant attorneys and I call them the dragon ladies because that's how I would describe the dragon ladies. You know, I didn't, so I found out that these tenant attorneys that were teaching this basic course actually were legal counsel for HUD-1 cases. So once it's fair housing and they can't resolve it within one year, it goes up the ladder to a HUD-1 case. They were the prosecuting attorneys for HUD and now they are tenant attorneys. So I wanted to take this class. I wanted to hear what they had to say. I wanted to listen to them, right? So this attorney is being extremely aggressive because she's trying to get her point over to landlords that don't know the rules. I get that. So she's slamming her hands down on the desk in front of me and putting her finger in my face going, I'm coming after you. And she's trying to be intimidating. I get it. I mean, whatever, lady, I'm whatever. But she said, I'm going to propound discovery on you and I'm going to seize your books and records on everything you own through the interrogatory process. And I did this. Oh, because I realized in that moment, that's how they get your books and records for everything else they own. They do it when they propound discovery on you. So I just learned how they do it. And I was like, oh, so she said that is, hey, I'm coming after you. So then she started giving me her playbook. I started taking notes. 
When I was done, I had seven pages of notes. I came back to the law firm I worked for and I handed them to the attorney. And he's looking to him going, how'd you get this? How'd you get this? Well, you know, I smiled, tipped my head sideways. They thought I was being a jerk and verbal vomited their whole plan at me. I wrote it down. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that you learn in these courses at Riverside. I thought that was golden. I learned how the tenant's attorney is going to attack the landlord. I want to know that. I want to know how. I want to know why. Yes, so that I can help landlords go, don't do that. <laughs> so I couldn't encourage you enough to go take Riverside's. It's great. They have great entertainment during lunch. They have people that come and sing, whatever. I, I'm there to learn, but it's a great, good, good way to get your fair housing certification in for the year. Okay. And I will be there. <laughs> um, a tenant ordered cable service. We agreed with the provider. Spectrum damaged our garage door, which cost us 150 to repair. Spectrum's claiming it's not their fault. Wrong. Not worth small claims or insurance. Any suggestions? <laughs> yeah. It's not Spectrum's fault. It's your tenant's fault. You know why? Your tenant hired Spectrum, not you, correct? Tell the tenant they're going to have to pay those expenses because the person they hired damaged your property. Oh, once a tenant figures out they got to pay it, they're going to be all over Spectrum. Hey, Patty, just a second. While you're on the su subject, uh, <clears throat> on, uh, on my roof, uh, 40 unit building, there are tons of antennas that are secured to the roof by heavy, I mean, very heavy cinder blocks. And that is dangerous, in my opinion. So, what should I do about it? I mean, you know, the, these are like blocks. Trays. Yes. Hold they're on. Too Hold on, I've, there shouldn't be a cinder block up there. So I'd let everybody know that they need to go review their satellite dish agreements. There's a lot of um, apartment associations that actually have satellite dish agreements. I strongly suggest that you start using one as part of your lease packet. Satellite dish agreement. What it says is if the installer installs a satellite dish on the roof and it causes damage, the tenant's responsible for that damage because they're the ones that hired the installer. Okay, satellite dish agreement. The AA has one. So this Agla. is LARS. Agla has one. There you go. LARS. So you can get uh, by with this. Absolutely. If it's in your original contract, you can't do a change of terms for it. But going forward, if that's your original agreement. When you're in RSO, you want to have everything documented at hello, because it's really hard to change the rules as it goes through the tenancy. But at the beginning is your chance to do everything that you can. So satellite dish addendum and agreement, AGLA has it, CAA has it. I'm sure AOA has one. If they don't, um, how do I say it without saying it? Uh, find an apartment association that works better for you. <laughs> I'm trying to be careful. Thank you, Paddy. Val, you didn't think of charging the tenant. You didn't hire the workman. Look at it this way. Tenant hires a paper delivery service, you know, the paper boy. I don't even know if they make newspapers anymore with the way that the world has changed, okay? Paper boy throws the paper and it breaks the front window. Who's responsible to pay for the front window? Tenant. Why? Their employee broke the window. Their guest. Your contract says that they're responsible for their employees and their guests. If they hire Spectrum to install cable and they fall through the ceiling, <laughs> whose fault is that? It's not the landlord's fault. The landlord didn't trip the guy, push the guy. The landlord probably wasn't even there. You understand it? Once you spin it back to make the tenant responsible, if you watch how quick the tenant gets all of Spectrum's insurance information. Because <laughs> they don't want to pay the bill. <laughs> 
How do oh, you I love understand? It too. Did I understand correctly when you said that um you can't add like uh do a change in term of tenancy for like the um for the satellite and also like the grills after the fact in the city of LA? Larso makes it extremely challenging. So any, this is how it was explained to me by an attorney and I've just held it close to my chest ever since then because it made sense to me, okay? Your original inception is where you can state all the rules. If you wanna change the rules down the road, there's only two right. that you can do without tenant consent and that's a rent increase and your attorney's fees clause everything else they have to agree with do you think a tenant's gonna agree to take on more responsibilities mm -hmm. no so try to convince the tenant to sign so, and agree to like anything for instance, thereafter. I have a property and you have a property where so I have um, some tenants in Inglewood that I was gonna in Inglewood that I was gonna serve them with the the new grill addendum. Do you think uh -huh. I'm not gonna be able to do that? That's Inglewood, not RSO. Go ahead. Inglewood oh, okay. is not okay. City of Los Angeles. RSO, RSO is just City. Of RSO is not just city of LA. RSO spread like cancer. It's city okay, of okay. Torrance, city of Wilmington. It's out in the Valley now, Sherman Oaks. But RSO is the one that's real restrictive that you have to agree if you're changing mid contract or mid tenancy. Okay. So that's the tricky one. But Inglewood, 30 day change of terms. Did I get a new lip stain? No, I have on new lip gloss. I think this color is much better. I just try to do a little something. <laughs> I, I got my wash and go hair going on today. So I'm just like, whatever. <laughs> All right, you guys, I'm going to go get some lunch. You guys have a great day. If there's anything else I can do for you, you guys all know how to hunt me now. And if you guys need Thank anything you. Else, let me know. Um, I will be live with Agla on Tuesday, just so you know, talking about AB 1482, which is a statewide rent control and how it affects us as landlords and how we can get out from under it with a single family residence or even a duplex. So you might want to catch me with Agla what, on Tuesday. What time? Um, 11 o'clock on Tuesday for Agla and sign up with them. And then I'll be back here Wednesday with Widget. And we have trade shows coming up. I know the AOA trade show, I think, was today. Agla's trade show is in May, and I will be at that. And I hope to see you all there. I will be there. I hope to see you there. <laughs> all right, you guys have a great week. Like I said, if you need me, hunt me down. Bye, everybody. Patty, thanks. Bye. <laughs>